Good morning and welcome to chapel. I am so glad you're here today. I hope you had a wonderful break. Hope you feel rested, rejuvenated, finished the semester strong. Got a few uh, few weeks left to, to finish strong and uh, yeah, I know that, that God's going to do some cool things over those last few weeks here. So if you would, please pray with me as we, uh, we open up today's chapel. Dear Lord, we just thank you for rest. Thank you for a break just to be able to uh, give our minds, uh, our bodies a chance to recuperate, to, to reinvigorate. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us as we come uh, and, and begin this these last, this last push, this last uh, leg of our journey this semester to, to give us strength. I pray that you would just strengthen us, encourage us. I pray that you would give us eyes to see what you're doing and the ways that you're working all around us. I pray that you would uh, encourage our hearts, give us strength and perseverance to press on, uh, even when things get tough. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, just meet us here today, speak your truth to us. I pray that you would open our ears Open our hearts to be able to hear and receive all that you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Today, our chapel speaker is Garrett Cars. He's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years maybe. And uh, he's a good friend. from. He's from Hayes, Kansas. He, um, I had someone step... uh, um, Email me and say, I can't make it to speak in chapel today. And so the uh, first one that popped in mind was Garrett. And uh, Garrett's a good brother. And uh, I'm excited that he's, it worked out for him to come. Garrett's a speaker, a pastor, an equipper. He's passionate about pursuing God's plan and purpose for our lives. He speaks often about knowing who God is, uh, our identity, and then the mission of God's people. He's the former director of Encounter, a young adult ministry at Celebration Community Church in Hayes. He's also the president and CEO of Dealing Hope, a Christian nonprofit dedicated to bringing hope to the hopeless. And so would you please help me welcome Garrett Carr as he comes to share God's word with us today. Hello. Welcome. So now you know I'm, I'm like the JV squad, you know, like... So he calls somebody else. He's like, all right, varsity guy, I can't play today, so we got to bring you up a level, so I'm sorry. But, you know, I, on the way down here, I felt led to pray for just a double portion of chapel credits for you guys. I know some of you all need a miracle, you know. So I'm, I was interceding for two hours for some of you all if you need to. So we'll see. We'll see how good I am at prayer and if Ryan's heart can be moved. You know what I'm saying? So... That's what I've been praying for. I've also been praying to become funny, and that hasn't been answered yet. So we're going to be in Psalm chapter 23. If you have your Bibles with me today, I just want to open up God's word and see what it has to say to us today. So Psalm chapter 23, it's probably one of the most famous psalms, right? It's one of the most famous psalms. It's uh, uh, basically a shepherd talking about a shepherd, right? Psalm Chapter 23, King David is writing this to us. It says this in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. This sounds really good. Right? I don't know. Maybe some of you, this is what spring break was like for you. Maybe some of it, it wasn't. Right? He says this in the middle of verse 3. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. I don't know about you. I love the first three verses of this passage this passage. It gives us this kind of invitation into intimacy with our shepherd, a a way that we can live where we actually know that our shepherd is going to take care of us. What would it actually look like for us to live as we lack nothing? I wonder if God's saying to us today, in this season, even though it might look like you lack something, you lack nothing, not because of what you can provide, but what the shepherd can provide for us. If we know who our shepherd is, we will know that he's our provider. So therefore, even though it may look like we lack 
we don't. But then it kind of transitions in verse 4, right? It says this, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I've been going through one of the hardest, most difficult seasons of my entire life. For the past uh, year to two years, it's been extremely difficult. In fact, I would say it's probably the most difficult uh, season of my life with Christ. It's been extremely difficult, and I've continued to come back to this passage because it has given me refreshment for my soul, a way to kind of understand that even though I'm I'm going through a dark valley, that my shepherd is with me. And the way that this passage for me has come to life is that when we look at, in verse 3, it says that he guides me along the right path for his name's sake. When we look at this passage, we automatically assume that it's the first couple of verses that he's talking about, right? That he guides me along quiet waters, that we're in green pastures, we're refreshment for our soul, and that's the right path. But what if... What if the author is actually saying that both of these are right paths? Not only the the quiet waters, the, the green pastures, but what if, just what if the darkest valley could be a right path? See, what I wonder if, as in Christianity, that we've avoided suffering, we've avoided the the dark valleys because we don't want to go through those things. But what if we're actually missing out on the fullness that God has if we're avoiding suffering? And what if we're missing on blessings that we'll never receive unless we go through a dark valley? There are many times... And, and maybe some of you here in this room, you're, you're in the midst of a, a dark valley, but if you're following Jesus, I can promise you one thing, there are dark valleys to come. And, and what I call these dark valleys for me is it's in the meantime, right? We want to go from pasture to pasture to pasture. We want to go, we just want blissful seasons for all of life. We don't want any dark valleys, but for some reason there's something that we need in the dark valley. And for me, it's, there's this space and time where between some. Okay, sorry. Uh, when something difficult happens and when God shows up. And for me, I call these seasons of life in the meantime. In the meantime, these seasons of difficulty, these seasons where we we can't figure out, we can't even see the the light at the end of the tunnel, we wonder, is this season ever going to come to a close? Is Jesus ever going to come down and rescue us out of these seasons? Is he even here? We start to ask all of these questions and wonder, God, why am I here? Why am I going through what I'm going through? I can remember... A difficult, in the meantime, season for me, uh, uh, literally about three months after I started following Jesus seriously in college, my dad was at a Husker football game because we're a glutton for punishment in our household. Um, And even though we have Matt Rule now, I'm just not holding my breath anymore because I thought Scott Frost was going to, never mind, you guys do not care about any of that. But he is at a Husker game, right? And he has a heart attack, which if you've ever, if you're a Husker football fan, that's every Saturday. He's 98 rows up in Memorial Stadium. He has a heart attack. They cart him out. I get a phone call on their way to the hospital. And they tell me, hey, your dad's had a heart attack. We don't even know if he's going to make it to the hospital. And I'm hours and hours and hours away wondering, God, what are you doing? And I go up to my church and I begin to pray for my dad, not only that he would uh, be healed or all, all these crazy prayers are coming to my mind, but he didn't know Jesus at the time. And then for me, I wasn't even necessarily as worried about his health as I was worried about his eternal destination. And so I'm praying all of these things, wondering, is my dad even going to make it to the hospital? God, please help us. And, and I have this crazy thought that comes into my mind. It's like, call your dad and share the gospel with him. I'm like, the last thing I want to do right now 
is do that. And then I had this crazy thought, and it's, it's one of the craziest thoughts I've ever had, and, and it hasn't really happened since, but he said, after you share the gospel, tell him that nothing's going to be wrong with him. Now, I don't know about you. That's ridiculous. My dad is dying. And I'm supposed to do this. And I, and I just had this weird feeling in my heart that I'm supposed to do this. And so I called my sister who is with him in the hospital. And I said, hey, Dad, Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. You know, the whole gospel presentation. I just want you to spend eternity with him and, and all of these things. And also this weird thing. I don't, I don't know if there's anything wrong with you. <laughs> and he's sitting in the hospital bed all hooked up, you know. And he goes, okay, Garrett, bye. Pfft, hangs up. And then I'm just mad at God. I'm like, why? I'm so stupid. That wasn't even God. What am I doing? I'm so crazy. And I entered a season of in the meantime. Because I'm wondering, God, what are you doing? Why would I say these things? What am I doing? Now, in the meantime, seasons don't have to be as difficult as, or as kind of weird as that situation is. It could be that, hey, maybe you don't quite have enough money to make the bills this month. Maybe you're struggling with family relations. Maybe you're struggling in your relationships. Maybe you're struggling in other ways. It doesn't have to necessarily be a huge difficult thing. In the meantime, could be a day or an hour or maybe 20 years. We don't know the length of what's going on in our life. But what I wonder is this, if the season, as it progresses, if we actually become forgetful. Forgetful about God, forgetful about who he is and what he's done for us. So today I want to talk about four things that we forget in the meantime. Four things that because of what's going on in our lives that we forget about God and we forget about God's people. The first one is this, that we forget that God is sovereign. Right? We forget that God's in control. And, and I think we do this because we, usually in the seasons of the meantime, we've lost control of what's going on in our lives. And if we've lost control, if we can't control our circumstances, if we can't control our situations, then we all of a, automatically assume that God's lost control too. Right? We start to believe these lies. Well, if God's not in control, then what's going on? And what I want us to remember is that God could easily prevent in his power what he allows in his wisdom. I to say that again? God could easily prevent in his power what he allows in his wisdom. God allows situations and circumstances in our lives in his wisdom. It doesn't mean that he created the situation. It doesn't mean that he's doing it to us, but he allows situations and things to happen, and the whole time he's in control, and we see this throughout scripture, right? And, and Job is probably the best example of this, right? He allows this to happen because he knows and he's actually still in control, and he knows the end of the story, but the problem is, is that we don't, and therefore we begin to believe things about God that are true, untrue. The next thing we forget is God's faithfulness, right? God's faithfulness. We wonder, God, how can you be faithful to me in this moment? Why is this happening to me? And a lot of times we don't ever get to the why in the midst of the meantime. We never understand. And a lot of times we'll start to see perspective when we come out of those seasons. But in the meantime, we start to wonder, do these current circumstances nullify God's faithfulness? God, I thought that you were going to do this in my life. God, I, I wondered, I thought, I've dreamt, I thought you were telling me these things and none of them have come true. Where are you? Are you faithful to me? And the thing that we have to remember is that our current circumstances don't nullify God's faithfulness. He will continue to be faithful to you no matter what. And we can't become forgetful in the meantime. The third thing that we forget is that God never leaves us and he never forsakes us. I think there are times and situations where when we're in the meantime, and we can't feel God's presence. No matter what we do, we're just in this desert season. We don't know, God, where are you? I can't feel you. And I don't necessarily need to say that that's what we need all the time. But we just, we really feel withdrawn from God. 
And there's so many times where we walk through seasons where we, be, we actually start to believe that God's not only left us, but he's forsaken us. He's forgotten all about us. God, how could I go through this and you could just be on the sidelines? What are you doing? And we want an end to the season, right? We want an end to the season of life. And we start to pray, God, would you please bring an end? Will you please bring this to the end of its situation? And my mom, she's telling me a story a while back about something that we were going through in high school. And I'm sure now it doesn't really matter. It's probably dumb. But at the time, it was a big thing for me, right? And she, she began to pray that, God, would you please rescue my son out of the situation? Would you please bring all of this to an end? And she was talking to a mentor of hers, and her mentor told her, hey, I, you know, I stopped praying that way a little while ago. I stopped praying that the end would come, and what I started praying for was that, that he would be, our children would be refined in the meantime. That we would actually start to believe that, hey, God is faithful, he is there, and he is doing something. And so I actually stopped praying for the end, but I started pr praying for the refining process to happen. I think Jesus uses the crucible of suffering to refine us into something that we would never know and never see unless we were actually living in the meantime. We have to stop avoiding suffering, avoiding pain, avoiding those things so that we can actually become who Jesus wants us to become in the fullness of who he wants us to be. If we want to be like Jesus, we actually have to live like he did. And I think he saw a few moments of suffering. The fourth thing that we forget is that we forget God's faithful followers. We forget the community of God that he has given us. We forget the people around us, and, and whether the, the suffering we have we endure is because of something that we have no control of, or maybe it's someone else's sin, or our own sin, or whatever it may be. We, we don't want other people to know that our life uh, isn't an Instagram real worthy moment. Right? We don't want anybody to know that we're going through the, the midst of what's going on. We have no idea. We don't want anybody to know. And I can remember for the last few years, I didn't want anyone to know what I was going through. I didn't want anyone to know the, the depths of what I was struggling with, the depths of, of fear and all of this stuff. And I can remember starting to tell my friends about six months ago about, hey, I'm, I'm dealing with this. I'm struggling with this. I, I'm really wrestling. This is a really hard season for me. And I regretted not telling my community way sooner. Because what they began to do in my life is they started to pour love and care and affection. They started to care about me, check in on me, wondering what I'm doing. And I saw the faithfulness of God's followers surround me in a way that I've never felt before. We become forgetful. We want to isolate. We don't want anyone to know what we're going through. And we're actually missing out on what God's designed us for. And I actually wonder if there are seasons in our life that God allows us to go through heavier situations that we can't carry ourselves because we need to know that we need each other. We need to know that we need each other in Galatians chapter 6 says that we're supposed to carry one another's burdens. And I don't know about you, I've been in ministry for 10 years. I'm really good at carrying other people's burdens, but I'm not really good at letting people carry mine. I'm really good at, hey, what's going on? Let me pray for you. Let me intercede for you. How, how are you doing? Checking in. Let's go. Let's do coffee. Let's do all these things. How can I help and support you? But when they ask me the same question, I'm good. I wasn't allowing other people to carry my burdens and lighten my load through what I was going through. But inevitably, I think we become forgetful, right? We forget who God is and the, and the people he's put in our lives. But there are times, there are situations where the seasons do come to an end. Right, the, 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 in the meantime, comes to an end, and, and Jesus shows up, and, and everything's awesome. Right, the end of my dad's story, and, and he's still alive and serving in a church, and he was sharing the gospel with the police officers a couple years ago when they pulled him over, and they didn't give him a ticket. So I don't know how you guys feel about that, but instead of crying, maybe we can share the gospel. That might work. I don't know. Maybe not here. 
you know, but like other places, you know, like, oh, they probably go to Tabor. They're just getting out of a ticket. But for my dad, about 10 months passed in between my phone call and when he gave his life to Christ. And for those 10 months, he went to doctor after doctor, hospital after hospital, and nothing came back with anything wrong. And for me, 10 months seemed like 10 years. 10 months of going, God, why did I say that? Why did I even share the gospel? What am I doing wrong? Am I a good, you know, am I a good son? What was I doing? I, I must have messed this up. I'm so sorry. God, please save my dad. Please erase from his memory anything that I've said to him or all those things. But 10 months of God's faithfulness showing up and him going, saying, hey, I'm going to the hospital. Me praying, God, please don't let anything come back wrong. He is one of four people who had a double rotator cuff surgery. One of four people in the world and didn't do his physical therapy wrong. And so when he overexerted himself, his muscles in his back would tighten so tight it would actually uh, uh, collapse on his um, spine and it would knock him out. One of four people in the entire world. And that's what God used to save my dad. A phone call and something that hardly anyone in the entire universe has gone through. And for me, 10 months seemed like 10 years, but for my mom, in the meantime, was 22 years. 22 years of being married to a, a good guy, but not a follower of Jesus. 22 years of spending her time on her knees praying to God, would you please save my husband? Would you please rescue him from his sin? So for me, 10 months seemed like a long time, but for my mom, she was faithful for 22 years. In the meantime... But what happens? We love to tell these stories, right? We love to tell these stories. We love to tell all these stories. But what happens when things don't end up the way we want? I was talking to a young college girl a few years back, and her younger brother was in elementary school, had, had cancer at the time. And he had passed a few years before this conversation. And we're just talking about his life and asked a really dumb question because I'm a man, so ladies just know that we ask dumb questions, okay? But I asked this question, hey, why do you think God didn't heal your brother? And she looked me in the eyes and said, Garrett, God did. I just didn't get to see it. He had an eternal perspective that I didn't have. I was looking for rescue on this side of eternity, and she was looking for rescue on the other side. See, the truth of the matter is that we're all in the meantime. That we're all in the meantime, that we live in a broken and sinful world, and Jesus has promised us that he's coming back. And that he will restore all things. There will be no pain. There will be no suffering. And it will be all restored. And I wonder, in the meantime, will we become forgetful? I hope not. Let's pray. Jesus, as we close this uh, service... I, I imagine in a room this large that there are people who are in the midst of, of the meantime. Maybe it's health, finances, family. I don't know exactly what it looks like. Uh, but you do. <laughs> you know what's going on in their lives. And you've, you've said that you're near to the brokenhearted. Lord, I've, I know over the past six months I've never felt closer to you than I am right now. Because of my circumstances and situations, I pray that whether we can feel a tangible presence or not, but we would actually know and believe that you are with us and that you're actually for us. And that you say in Romans 8 that you are working all things for the good of those who love you. That you would actually make us and form us into your son's image and that we would actually understand what we're going through. But Jesus, in the meantime, I pray that you would be close to us, 
that you would understand and, and, and you actually have suffered. You understand us. In a world that doesn't believe God can understand suffering, you came out of heaven. You came out of the perfect world to a broken, sinful world. You put on flesh and you understand our suffering in a way that maybe we can't even comprehend. I pray that you would, um, maybe you wouldn't even bring a conclusion <laughs> to all the suffering going on, but we would actually stop praying for the end and we pray for us to become more like you. That we would be refined in a way that we would never understand. And then on the other side of being in the meantime, whether it's on this side of eternity or not, that we would know we can trust you. And Jesus, if, if there's anyone here in this room who hasn't put their faith in your death and resurrection and, and following you in a way that's meaningful, I pray that even maybe even today's message, a, a hope beyond eternity, the only way we can have a hope in that is because of what you've done, that they would put their faith and trust in you and that no matter what they go through, you're for them and that you believe in them. No matter where they've been, what they've done, they can trust you and what you've done on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, before we dismiss, uh, I just want you to know that um, there are people here for you, that if you're going through, uh, in the meantime, that there are plenty of people around here for you. And maybe it's a family member, um, but I'll be here uh, at lunch in a little time after. If, if you just need somebody to talk to, I just want to extend a hand. Hey, I'm here. Uh, I don't want to just come talk for 28 uh, minutes or whatever it's been and dip out. Like, I, I care about you, I, and I've been going through the hardest season of my life. And there have been people who have walked alongside of me. And I, and I know Ryan, and I'm sure there are other faculty here on campus that would love to know, hey, what's going on in your life? We want to care about you. We want to walk this through uh, because you're not meant to do it alone, okay? Thank you guys for having me. God bless you. you have something for them?